Well, hello everyone. How's it going? This is Sameer Kocher. I'm an actor. I'm an anchor. I've hosted the IPL for many, many years. But most importantly, I'm here to tell you that I'm going to be your official host for the Creator Space series. Now, at Creator Space, we bring a unique theme each time and bring renowned speakers for our young audience. And I welcome you to this amazing event, which has already seen stupendous success in the previous editions. Now, some of you are joining us from the US, a very good morning to you. And to all our friends, our young adults in India, a very good evening. Now, the previous editions, they were called the Future Creator Summit. And they, we have this special session called Hackathon 101 coming up for you guys later in the evening. Do not forget to watch that. Now, let's start off. I want to bring some very special friends who were backstage with me. Um, they were looking very eager to get on stage. Some wonderful friends. These are our proud white hatters. We're going to bring on Kelly from Los Angeles. Mary from London, Daniel from Los Angeles, and from our very own India, we have Pratyaksh. Can we have the kids on stage, please? Let's get them up on stage. Let's get them up on stage. There they are. There they are. How's it going? How's it going, Kelly? Good. So good to see you. You're looking lovely. I was asking her earlier whether she's read all those books behind her. She said, well, most of them. Right, Kelly? All right. A big hi. Hello to all other friends there. Kids, it's great to have you out here. Let's get this session rolling. Now, I've heard you guys love your polls and quizzes. How about we start Mission Mars with a quick quiz session? For the YouTube viewers, guys, don't miss out and come join us here live because we have many more quizzes and polls lined up. Before we start with the first set of quiz questions, we would love to share the leaderboard for the students who've answered most questions correctly and fastest during Scott's first session here with us. Can we have the leaderboard slide on the screen, please? There you go. That looks interesting. Ages 12 plus, ages 12 under, Adya Mishra leading there and Anmay Subha leaving there. Great too. Fantastic, guys. Fantastic. But here's the thing. Here's the thing as always. Those who are ahead in the leaderboard will have to maintain their lead. The things about leaderboards, though, is it can change at any point. So answer your questions correctly and do it fast. Are you guys ready for this? Yeah? Okay. Now the kids up on screen with me. I'm going to like be asking you whether you know the answers or not. But the questions go out to everybody out there, guys. So focus and try your best at getting the answers right. Right, Kelly. Kelly is good to go. And so are everybody else. Pratak, you can smile for me a bit. Can you smile a bit? Yes, there he is, Pratyaksh, looking good, looking solid, looking strong. Okay, guys, the quiz is on. Be ready. The first question coming up on your screen. Here it is. Who was the first man in space? Was it Alexei Leonov? Was it Neil Armstrong? Was it Yuri Gagarin? Was it Scott Kelly? Who was it? I'm looking at the poll on my right. Well, the poll's going, the poll's going up and down. It's fluctuating. Does Kelly know it? Does Pratyaksh know it? Yes, they both know it. He's thinking about it. I hope you aren't Googling it, Pratyaksh. He's thinking about it. Okay, fine. All right. So first, well, the poll out here is going towards option C. But let's see what the right answer first is. Can we have the right answer, please, guys? The answer is Yuri Gagarin. And 34% of you got it. Well, the Neil Armstrong bit does throw one off. But the right answer is Yuri Gagarin. All right, next question, guys. Get ready. Focus. Here it is. Who was the first woman in space now? Was it Valentina Terkashova? Was it Sally Ride? Was it Mae Jameson? Or was it Svetlanta Savitskaya? Who was it? Think about it. Think about it. I'm looking at the poll right now, guys. The poll is changing. Yes, it's changing every second. It's going up and down. I'm checking right here. Does Kelly know the answer? The both of the conference, the kids are like, How do I get to? Oh, never mind. I see it. Let's see what the answer is, though, first. Let's see what the answer is. We're tilting towards Valentina. Is that the right answer? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well done, Kelly. Oh, she's pumping her fist out there. She knew that one. I hope all the other guys, Pratyaksh knew it too. 
Yes, he did. He's looking solid on that. Okay, the third question, the last question in this first set of questions coming on your screen, guys. Go for it. Here it is. The date on which Neil Armstrong landed on the moon was an even number and the year was an odd number. Find the correct date. 15th July, 69. 20th July, 69. 20th July, 68. 19th July, 69. Think about it. Think about it. Year, even number, and the year was an odd number. Hmm? My God, people are just thinking, thinking it all and going different directions towards the pole. Oh, wait a minute. There's, there's a, there was a 100% that came up on one on the 20th of July. That's leading the race right now. But what is the right answer? The right answer on your screen, it is 20th of July, 1969. Well done, guys. Well done. Now, that ends our first quiz round. And I can, by the looks of the poll out here, I can see you guys have done very, very well. Now, this is just a teaser to what tonight holds, guys. Now that we're all warmed up, I would love to start the event with the first session for tonight. Mission Human Space Flight. The name itself is super exciting and I'm thrilled. Are you? Show us some love through emojis, guys. Come on. Show us some love through emojis and reactions. I want to see them all. Pop them up on my screen. There they are. There they are. Send lots and lots of emojis. All right, guys. Let me walk you through this amazing session. Now, we have a very, very special person here who's joining us. A former military fighter pilot, test pilot, an engineer, a former NASA astronaut, and a former U.S. Navy captain. One man, many roles. The name is Mr. Scott Kelly. Now, did you guys know that Scott spent 340 consecutive days in space? Now, who else can tell us more about space better than Mr. Scott himself? Can we have Mr. Scott on stage, please? Let's welcome him out here. Well, thank you, uh, Samir. It is great to be here with uh, Baiju Future School and White Hat Junior. Well, it's great to have you out here, Scott. We can't wait to hear from you. And um, it's a privilege for us to be listening to you for the next hour as you're going to take us a step closer to the amazing journey that your life and professional career has been. We're really looking forward to it. Well, thank you, Samir. And uh, hey, kids, it is a real pleasure uh, to be here with you guys today, and I'm going to get my uh, screen share uh, set up. Um, yeah, yeah, Scott, we'd have uh, these wonderful kids. Can we have a photo op session with you for a second so everyone can smile and take this one lovely photograph with you? Sure. All right, guys, kids, bring your best smiles on the screen. There you go. Thank you. Well, Scott, I'm going to leave you with this wonderful audience for now because I know the audience must be super excited to listen to you, and so am I. The kids and I will take your leave. We'll be backstage. Give us a call out. Give me a call out, Scott. Once you're done, I will join you. It's over to you for now. Okay. Well, thanks again, Samir. And uh, hey, kids, really great to be here with you uh, this morning. I'm actually in uh, Colorado, so it's uh, 8.15 a.m. for me. I understand that uh, you guys are in different places around the world. I saw Kelly there. I think Kelly was in... Uh, Los Angeles, but uh, understand there are kids from all over the world. So what I wanted to talk to you guys about today is about Creator Space Mission Mars, but really from uh, the perspective of what we're doing right now uh, to prepare for that Mars mission. And that starts with this incredible place called the International Space Station that I had the uh, privilege of spending Wow, over over 500 uh, days of my life on. And uh, this space station, as you can see here in this picture, uh, is a unique uh, picture for a couple of reasons. One, it has the space shuttle attached to it. So this was taken by a Russian Soyuz. And in that space shuttle was my twin brother, Mark, uh, when uh, he was on board the space station for his last mission. He was the commander of that space shuttle. But I'm going to show you a little bit of an introductory video here. Has some music, and uh, just gives you a little bit of an exciting sense for what uh, what the space station looks like. And then I'll talk 
about a lot of this stuff in particular, um, you know, starting with the functioning of the space station, life as an astronaut in space, also um, an experiment that I was involved in called the twins uh, study. And then, you know, a little bit about what it's gonna take for us to get to Mars. So I'm gonna just let this video continue to roll here for a few, for a minute or so. So we've been flying on this space station for over 20 years. In November of uh, 2000, so before all of you kids were alive, we've had people in space. So you have never, the kids out there in the audience, maybe some of the parents, but the kids out there in the audience have never been on planet Earth with every human. We've always had people living and working in space since November 2nd of 2000, which is a pretty pretty incredible feat if you uh, consider that. So the space station. So what is it? How big is it? If you put it on the ground, it would be the size of a football pitch. And I'm going to use pitch because I think that's more understandable. We say field in the U.S., and that is a uh, football, like gridiron football, American football field in the picture. But it is uh, same size as a, as a football pitch. The space station weighs almost a million pounds is how big it is. And it flies at an altitude somewhere around 250 miles, which I think is about, what, 400 kilometers maybe. Um, and that... Altitude varies based on um, friction with the little bit of atmosphere that's up there. Our, our altitude lowers over time and we have to raise it up. But the space station is going 17,500 miles an hour, which is about 17,500 miles an hour faster than you go in a car. And it orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. So every uh, 45 minutes, you're seeing either a sunset or a sunrise. And you do that 16 times a day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the space station generally has six people on board. Uh, right now it has a crew of seven. We could actually have uh, seven permanent crew members. We've started doing that uh, more recently. But sometimes you could have as many as um, 13 or 14 people on board the space station if you had a visiting crew or you're changing out different uh, crew members. Now I'm gonna, when I talk to you guys, I'm gonna, I know there are some young kids out there and uh, I try not to talk down to kids or people in general, I try to talk up to them. So for some of the littler kids, some of the stuff might not be that applicable or interesting because it might be a little bit hard to understand. Um, but I still am not gonna talk down to the little kids but hopefully you'll find some of this stuff interesting. So the space station flies at what's called an inclination. Basically, if you have, let me grab my earth here. Imagine if you launch from the equator and you launch like due east, you just go over the same spot on the earth all the time. But if you launch at an angle this way, as the earth is turning like this, you're going to cover a different ground path over the Earth on every single orbit you make. So in our orbit on the Earth, we're covering 90 percent of the world's population while flying on the space station for that uh, at that what's called orbital inclination. And again, we fly over the uh, around the Earth 16 times a day. Um, which is equivalent to the distance from the Earth's, Earth to the moon and back, um, which is hard to believe. I don't know, I'm not sure if that's correct. I'm gonna have to do the math on that. But to begin to build the space station, it took us 41 different assembly flights flying the space station uh, pieces up in the payload bay of the space shuttle, but also 
A lot of those pieces launched on other vehicles, the Russian uh, Soyuz and Proton rockets, um, and also rockets from other countries as well. There's been over 240 people that have lived on the space station from 19 different countries. And building it involved over 100,000 people, uh, 500 different companies in uh, 37 different U.S. states, but also 16 different countries around the world. And the space station, is it's big. It's got a volume of a really, really big house, like a, maybe a four or five bedroom house. Sometimes we say it's got the volume of um, a Boeing 747, if you can imagine a big airplane. Now, having said that, there's a lot of stuff inside the space station. So uh, it's not like you feel like you have a ton of room, but I think it's enough. There were, if you took all the wires on the space station, it would be eight miles of um, wires just for the electrical power system. And important for you guys, because a lot of you guys are coders out there and you're learning how to code. There are 3.3 million lines of code on the ground to support 1.8 million lines of code that are on the computers on the space station itself. And computers are so very important. So the space station is, is separated in two particular sections. There's what's called the U.S. operational segment. And then there's the Russian segment of the space station. And they are very much different. They're designed differently. They look differently. They feel differently but they are connected in the middle and they function as one giant laboratory that is connected um, on the top of it. it has this huge long truss which holds the giant solar arrays that we use to produce energy uh, from the sun and that's how we operate all the equipment on board the space station is a really great example of a renewable energy system um, we take on board the space station our urine and we turn it into water, which we then drink. Then we turn it into urine again. Then we drink it again. Actually, we drink it again after we turn it into water. I know what your kids are thinking. That guy drank his pee for a whole year, right? Actually, I drank everyone's pee. It's all mixed together. But it does taste better than the water in Florida. For those of you who have been to Disneyland and have that Florida water, it ain't too good. Water on the space station is really good. We take some of that water, we turn it into oxygen using electrolysis. So we separate the oxygen from the hydrogen. The hydrogen is dumped overboard and the oxygen we use to breathe. We scrub the atmosphere of carbon dioxide in the life support systems. All these things that we're going to have to know how to do really, really well if we want to go to Mars someday. If you're on your way to Mars and the toilet breaks, and you can't fix it, you're gonna die. No two ways about it. So these are the type of things we're trying to understand a little bit with having people in space for a long time. Like I said, this is an international program, different space agencies representing 15 different nations around the world, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, which involves a bunch of different countries in Europe, the Japanese um, Aerospace Exploration Agency, of course, NASA and the Russian Federal Space Agency, which sometimes people wonder and ask me, hey, you're flying with the Russians and your country and Russia doesn't always get along together. And how does that affect your working in space? And I can honestly tell you, it has no effect. In space, the most important thing is we are crew members and any kind of political stuff that goes on with our countries, completely secondary, really doesn't matter much. We are there to support each other, really rely on each other, literally, for our lives, um, if, if, that, if it came to that. The space station is a global partnership, and there are all different uh, countries around the world that are involved in certain capacities. This slide shows the different control centers around the world that we uh, interface with, um, you know, a lot in the United States, the Johnson Space Center, but also the European Space Agency. Um, we train in Cologne, but we have the control center we talk to in Munich. Uh, we train a lot in Russia, in Japan, in Canada, and other places around the world as uh, required. 
And here's all the different uh, control centers you can see, which is interesting uh, when you're in space, getting to talk to these people from around the world. Now, when you're training for the space flight, it makes it a little challenging because one day you might be in uh, Houston and the next day you got to fly to Japan and spend a few weeks there. And then you go to Germany or Russia and then you're back home. And it's really one of the most challenging parts of being an astronaut on the space or training to be an astronaut. So in addition to the countries that have astronauts on board, there are 108 countries um, around the world that are involved in certain aspects of the space station, particularly the science. And you can see countries here on this map in Africa, South America, you can see India there, India there. I know there are a lot of people from India and uh, I am very excited about India launching uh, humans in space here uh, really soon. Uh, that's gonna be really fascinating to see. And I'm very, very much looking forward to India becoming a, uh, a new um, human space flight, uh, space faring nation here, not too, uh, not too far in the distant future. But as you can see, you know, worldwide participation involves, uh, is involved in the space station program with different launchers and ways to get there uh, from countries around the world. We have in the left corner, the Soyuz and the Progress, they're Russian spacecraft that launch uh, people and, and payloads. The ATV, which is uh, uh, the autonomous transfer vehicle, uh, no longer flies, but it used to fly from uh, the European. Uh, the HTV is a Japanese cargo vehicle that I uh, have seen in space a couple of times. Uh, while I was there, and that launches on a Japanese rocket. Of course, uh, we also, you know, used to fly the space shuttle. Uh, we don't anymore, but we have other ways to get people into space, uh, to and from the space station from the United States, particularly the SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 rocket with a Dragon cargo vehicle or crew vehicle on top if there are people in it. And of course, uh, here, hopefully within the next year, we'll have another uh, way to get people into space on a Boeing rocket that will uh, launch um, uh, to the space station and it will land on land, kind of like uh, the Russian Soyuz lands. So what's like life like for an astronaut in space? Uh, it's hard. It's a challenging thing, living and working in space where you're always uh, living with a certain amount of risk. You're living in an enclosed environment. Uh, you're living with a lot of people all on top of one another, people from different cultures, um, you know, that may not be like your own, which actually is one of the things that makes it so great. Uh, the picture on your left is my crew quarters where I slept. It's the size of what I used to say is a phone booth, but I understand that you kids out there don't even know what a phone booth is anymore. So it's like a little small room, like a, maybe like a bathroom on an airplane is where you would live uh, on the space station. It has a door. It's actually pretty comfortable. My last uh, one crew quarters was on the wall, but I also slept on the ceiling on my previous long duration flight. And you have some computers in there. You can talk to your friends and family, make phone calls. You have a sleeping bag that hangs on the wall. You can watch movies. You have personal items uh, inside. It's like a little house, tiny house, probably the tiniest house there is. Um, and of course, you know, everything floats in space. So it makes life in space very, very challenging. Uh, we, our physiology evolved with gravity. So, uh, certain aspects of our physiology don't uh, behave well in space. As an example, you know, our bodies are always trying to push our blood against gravity up to our head. Well, in space without gravity, that fluid just is accumulates in your head and your head feels full and swollen. It like stuffs up your sinuses. Um, the CO2, carbon dioxide on the space station can be high which affects um, how you feel. Um, and of course, when everything floats, it makes everything so much harder to do. Look around your room not right now, wherever you guys may be, look around your room and imagine if 
you couldn't put anything down on the floor, anything down on the table. Uh, everything had to be either taped or Velcroed or put away or hold held on to how much more difficult that would make your lives. And that's what it's like living in space. Two exceptions. There are two things that, that are easier. One is moving around objects that are really, really large and heavy because they don't have weight. So you can move something that weighs a thousand pounds. And the other thing that's easier is imagine if I had to fix that TV behind the wall, I could just float up there and kind of put my hand behind it, which is hard to do with gravity. So those two things are easier. Eating, very complicated. Like I said, everything floats, so everything needs to be in bags and packages. If it wasn't for something called surface tension with water, you know, people wonder like why all of our food isn't floating away all the time. Well, it's because of what what you what we have is uh, what you refer to as surface tension. So if I take this water and I put it on my hand, even if I turn my hand over, there's still water sticking to the bottom of my hand, and that's because of surface tension. So surface tension in space very important. Without it, if there wasn't that physical property of surface tension, I don't know if we could actually fly in space. But this is our table where we would eat. It's kind of on the wall. So it's sort of, you know, it's not flat like a table. It's more like an angle to save space. And you just Velcro or tape all your food down there. Uh, a lot of times we uh, spend time fixing the hardware uh, and the equipment on the space station. And this is a uh, Something I would spend, I would say about a third of my time doing is um, repairing stuff on board. And this is the carbon dioxide removal assembly, which is a very complicated piece of equipment that because the space station never comes home, we have to be trained to do all these different uh, activities. So not only are you the scientist, which I'm doing a science experiment in this case, but you're also... Um, you serve in every role. I mean, you might be the commander of the space station. You could be the pilot of the Soyuz, the commander of uh, uh, or pilot of another uh, launch vehicle. You're the engineer. You're the scientist. You're the IT person. You're the electrician. You're the plumber. You're the janitor or cleaning person. Uh, you're the doctor and the or the dentist. I've actually, you know, removed uh, teeth or had to fix a tooth in one of my uh, crewmates that their tooth fell out while they were in space and, you know, we couldn't call a dentist. But the space station is about the science. I mean, it is a laboratory in space. We're doing scientific experiments in all different uh, types of disciplines. The uh, U.S. laboratory module is very sophisticated science. You can see how it looks very, very busy. There are all these experiments on the walls, the ceilings, uh, the floor. Uh, this is one of the laboratory modules. There is also a European Space Agency laboratory mo module called Columbus. There's a Japanese one, and there are other ones you know, on the Russian segment. But here's a little fly through. You can see the rodent habitat. We had rodents on board. There's freezers for experiments, um, 3D printers, a window uh, facility to look at the earth, furnaces, incubators. Uh, microscopes for different types of experiments. There's also a German guy right there, astronaut crew member in the back. Uh, I think he was watching TV. So all the science we do, it's great research in basic, um, a lot of basic sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, material science, pharmaceuticals, things like that. Science that is designed to improve life of humans on earth. But then a lot of the science is about our mission to Mars someday. And that is something that I uh, truly believe is gonna happen absolutely in your lifetimes as kids. Hopefully in mine, I'll get to see it and I'll get to see one of you guys going to Mars someday. So that's why in March of 2015, me and this dude over here, this Russian guy, I call him my Russian brother from another mother, he and I launched to the space station for a year in 2015 because someday we want to go to Mars, like I said. And there's a lot of technologies that we are testing on the space station to allow us to do that someday. Technologies in robotics, 3D printing, 
making spare parts. If you're on your way to Mars and you something breaks and you don't have a spare part to fix it, you could die. So we're going to have to understand how to make these spare parts with 3D printing, with new materials, um, our environmental control systems. Uh, if we can't keep them working well in low Earth orbit where you have the ability to come home or where you uh, can get spare parts sent to you, uh, you're not going to make it to Mars. We ha have to understand our food system. You know, how are we going to be able to grow food on Mars someday for, you know, our nutrition? Are we going to have to send that to us and have it waiting there for us? You know, what kind of exercise do we need to do to prevent our bodies from deteriorating in this environment where um, we lose 1% of our bone mass every month or in space? We lose muscle mass. If we don't do anything to prevent it, the effects of radiation, all those things. You know, all the safety equipment on board the space station, how well does that work to protect us when we go to Mars someday? And like I said, the human, you know, the human element of it is really the key. I think the weakest link to going to Mars someday is our own physiology and how the environment affects us. And that's why I was part of this year-long mission and uh, also did uh, part of it involved my twin brother, Mark, with this thing called the twin experiment. You know, he and I are identical twins. So, and he's also an astronaut, even though he no longer worked at NASA. So NASA was studying us on a genetic level to try to understand um, how the radiation, the microgravity, the stress of living in space, how this affects us in uh, many, many different areas. Uh, oh, anyone figure out which guy I am? I'm the guy on the right with the gum in his mouth. That's my brother, Mark, on the left. So this uh, twin experiment wanted to test what happens to my body in space. And over the course of this year, I'll see, uh, you know, almost 11,000 sunrises and sunsets. I'll have to exercise more than 700 hours during my year-long mission to prevent my bones and muscles from deteriorating. I'll uh, drink, what does it say, 730 liters of recycled urine and sweat on the space station. I'll have to run 648 miles. I'll do uh, 383 experiments, actually more like 400 over the course of the year. I'll get a lot of radiation on board the space station. Um, we, we won't talk about the other thing, but here's what happens to me while spending a year in space and the stuff we're trying to test for, um, effects on my vision, you know, human factors, how well I am able to perform over the, my job over the course of this year. What happens to my microbiome? Our microbiome are all these uh, bacteria that live inside of us, mostly in our uh, digestive system that are really important to our overall health. Um, you know, will I be able to fly a spacecraft and land it on Mars after being in space for a really long time? What is, my, what is the psychological impact of this mission? How does it affect my metabolism, my physical performance? So all these things that we needed to understand so someday we can go to Mars someday. A lot of different research teams involved, uh, 10 major investigations. I took uh, 285 biological samples, tested 10 billion uh, miles of my DNA over the course of the year uh, using 183 different blood samples. So basically a lot of science and uh, things we needed to learn from this uh, twin study with my brother, uh, Mark and I. And the results, a lot of them were pretty interesting. You know, my immune system wasn't really affected uh, all that much. My gene expression changed. So our genes are not the pants we wear, they can be, but genes are our DNA, RNA, protein, uh, all the stuff that makes us who we are. And when I was in space for a year, 7% um, of my gene expression changed. And the expression is whether it's turned on or off. We don't know exactly what that means, but we know it changed. Hopefully it didn't change for the worst. Um, I hope, uh, but we'll see. And we'll see how that affects us long-term 
in going to Mars. My microbiome, those bacteria I talked to you about, they changed while I was in space. My telomeres, which are the ends of our, uh, our chromosomes, they're little caps on the ends of our chromosomes, really an indication of our physical age. They actually got better while I was in space. And, uh, you know, first NASA thought maybe that was due to, uh, due to uh, you know, exercise and diet. But we learned uh, after I got home that the Japanese had some worms, little worms on the space station, and their telomeres got better too. And I never once saw those guys working out on the treadmill, those little worms, never saw them running or anything. So there's a lot more to this than meets the eye, I think. Um, yeah, so that's, those are some of the results of the experiment. But, you know, the best part, about having a uh, an identical twin, maybe really the only good part is the spare organs. So any of you twins out there, you got that going for you. So one of the cool things about the space station is it gives you this unique perspective on Earth. You see the Earth as a whole. You don't see countries um, separated by political borders. You see the planet. You understand there are people down there. You know, they have challenges depending on where they live, different challenges. And living on the space station, you recognize that uh, we can accomplish some pretty great things if we put our minds to it. And also, you get a very unique perspective on um, the environment. You know, you see the Earth, despite it being very beautiful. You also see that the atmosphere is incredibly fragile and thin. Uh, certain parts of the planet almost always have pollution on it. Uh, covered uh, over it. Um, and certainly the rainforest in South America changed over the course of my 17 years flying in space. So, you know, even though I'm a big believer in going to Mars, we need to go to Mars. We don't need to go to Mars because we ruined Earth. We need to take care of this planet. It's so, so very important. It is our home and something that, uh, you know, we should all cherish and appreciate uh, having um, as our home because it is incredibly, as far as we know, unique. Um, but it definitely changed my perspective on the planet. Uh, this is the crew that's up there now on the space station. And they're from, uh, let's see, we got American guys. We got a Russian, a Japanese guy, a guy from France and another Russian and three Americans, including, uh, uh, female astronaut, Megan MacArthur Benkin, all uh, friends of mine. And if you guys want to learn more information, there's some links and uh, we can get those to you on any of this information if you need to read about it further. So I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, Samir uh, and we can get right into uh, either another quiz or the Q&A. Well, thank you so much for that, Scott. That was uh, absolutely exceptional. I'm learning so much out here, hearing the stuff that you're saying. And I must tell you, the vision you have of people up in spaces that they're floating around, having a great time, but the body has endured so much from what you've been telling us. How do you look back at this entire experience of yours, 340 days in space? How do you look back at the entire journey of yours? You know, the best thing about it was that it was a really, really hard and challenging thing to do. Probably the one of the most challenging things I've ever had to do. But that's what makes it so rewarding, is that when you choose something that is difficult and challenging, maybe something that you think you may not even be able to achieve, the satisfaction you get from accomplishing your, uh, your goals is, uh, you know, something that's hard to replace. And then being able to share that success with your, you know, your family, your friends, and uh, and you guys here today at uh, Bijou Future School and White Hat Junior. So uh, that's absolutely the best part. Well, I can tell you, speaking of challenges, we've got loads of challenges for our young adults who are present out here. We had three questions that we threw up at them before the show started. And we have a few more questions that we're going to throw up to them. And very happy that you're going to be out here. Maybe I'm going to ask you a few hints to the answers so you can share them while the guys mm -hmm. are answering them. So let's have a quiz. Three more questions coming your way, all you young adults. And I can tell you, many, many emojis are coming on the screen. People are really, really happy with what you've said. The first question of uh, the second round of questions is, what has a gravitational pull so strong that light cannot escape it and everything in it gets swallowed? Black hole, pinhole, white hole, manhole. 
you want to give a slight hint there scott any, any kind of hint you want to give them don't give them the entire answer you know i think that is such an easy question that doesn't even require a hint and All it right. looks like it looks like the polling indicates that it certainly does up to 96% went up to 98 in fact what's the right answer come on tell us black, black hole. hole it is black hole it is well done and there's, All a, and there's a big one and there's a big one in the center of our galaxy big the black big hole one. All right, all right. Let's see the second question of the day. The second question is, why is the Hubble telescope located in space? A, so its images aren't distorted by Earth's atmosphere. B, to check the Earth's atmospheric conditions. C, to observe light in the visible spectrum. Or D, all of the above. What is the poll saying? What is the poll saying? Any hints you want to give them? Scott, on this one? Um... Well, one hint I would say is we we don't point Hubble at the Earth, um, so that might rule out two of the answers. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, two of them have been ruled out by him. So you're left with two of them, and the poll is going towards all of the above. What is the right answer? Let's have a look at it. Oh, so it is A. So its images aren't distorted by Earth's atmosphere. Well, the third question now coming away, guys. This is the last one. Here it is. What does stars moving away from each other tell us? A, stars attract each other. B, the universe is expanding. C, stars repel each other. Or D, the universe is contracting. Once again, mm -hmm. Scott, be nice to all our fellow young adults here and uh, probably guide them in the right direction so they start thinking correct. Well, we do know that anything with mass has gravity. So everything uh, with gravity attracts each other. Uh, having said that, um, that's not the right answer. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> not okay. that is not the right answer. That is not the right answer. But what is the right answer? Let's find out on our screen. The universe is expanding. That's the way, guys. That's the way. And I can see that most of our guys have gotten this one correct as well. But that mm -hmm. ends the second round of quiz questions. Now, Scott, we have some wonderful questions to ask you. There have been questions being thrown at us. And, of course, we know how valuable your time is. So we have about five sets in which we have three questions placed out. And we're going to be running a like, like a poll with all our young friends out there who are going to give us on the poll. And the maximum number of, uh, of wants towards a question will be the question that will be thrown towards you. So if you can have those questions, in fact, uh, the first question is going to be coming up is the first set is the life of an astronaut. Okay, it's a very interesting one. So the three options on your screen, guys, you got to tell us which one you want. At what age did you realize you were interested in space? What is your best memory during your stay at the International Space Station? What did you find most difficult while being in space for so long? I'm going to go to the poll right here. Um, well, it's, a, it's a tie up between all three, actually. I'm going to give them a few more minutes, a few more seconds, actually, to see it. No, I think the first one. No. What did you find most difficult while being in space for so long? If you can answer that for us. Scott. Yeah. So, you know, the hardest part is about is being in a space where you can't leave or have very little freedom. Uh, that makes it challenging, uh, which also makes it rewarding. And I think people on Earth here have experienced something similar with this pandemic, where at times you might be locked into your house or not have the ability to go to school or the freedom to do what you want. And the, but the way I dealt with that, of, of that isolation, is that I recognized that was part of my job. And, you know, generally we want to do our jobs well. So I looked at the isolation, the hardest part of it, as part of what I was being asked to do. So I think when you put it in that perspective, it made it a little easier, made it able me able to deal with it. I knew that someday it would be over. That makes it easier as well. And I think with this pandemic and how we've had to live our lives for the past over a year, is that um, if we think of it as being part of our jobs about following the guidance of the experts in epidemiology and diseases and public health, then it makes the situation easier. I want to look back at this pandemic thinking, you know, I did everything right uh, and was part of the solution versus part of the problem. Um, and also, you know, 
trust the experts. When I was on the space station, if I had trouble with something, if I had even like dealing with the isolation, if I, I had the ability to talk to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, I understand with this pandemic, there are a lot of mental health challenges for people. Don't ever be afraid to reach out for help. It's what we do at NASA and it is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but yeah, that was the hardest part. Well, you make it sound very easy, but I can't even imagine being in the position that you were in at that point and for so many days at one go, but a great learning for life that if you're in the space of isolation or any problems in life is how to overcome them. All right, the second set is uh, debunking the myths, part one. And uh, three questions up for you guys, get on the poll. The first one is you will burn up in space if you get sucked out in an airlock. You have to work out constantly in space or else you will pass out. Or if something explodes in space, it makes no sound. I'm gonna go to the poll now. Let's see where we're at with this one. Okay, we're going towards you will burn up in space currently, but it's a pretty even matchup. Guys, quickly, last four seconds, five seconds. All right, I think 51%. You will burn up in space if you get sucked out in an airlock. Okay, so I, I was hoping that was going to be the answer. So I'm assuming when you say you get sucked out of the airlock, that means you, you're not in a spacesuit because if you got sucked out, I think you're not expecting it. So first of all, you wouldn't live very long. So whether you burn up or not would really not matter because you'd be dead pretty quickly without a spacesuit on. But eventually at the orbit that the space station is in, which is in like 100, uh, 400 kilometers, 250 miles above the Earth, uh, there's enough, a little bit of an atmosphere up there, very little that provides enough drag that over time, probably months, you would burn up in the atmosphere, you would re-enter. Now, satellites that are at what's called geosynchronous orbit, like 25,000 miles, um, they would be up there. Like if you got sucked out at that altitude, you'd be up there for millions of years before you re-entered the atmosphere. So, uh, and burned up. So you would burn up eventually depending on what altitude you got sucked out at. Fantastic. Now we got a set two as well. We got our next uh, set three, actually. It's debunking the myths, part two. And uh, here are the questions. NASA is working on warp speed so we can travel with the speed of light. The only way to survive interstellar, tra interstellar travel is to freeze yourself in cryosleep or you don't get bacterial or viral infections in space since space has no life. Come on, guys. <laughs> The warp speed is being quite uh, quite looked at with warp speed in the poll. Yes, yeah, six to three percent leading the poll. So NASA is working on on warp speed so we can travel with the speed of light. Scott. So you know it's interesting to see how over the course of uh, humanity, stuff that at some point is science fiction becomes science fact, and I think well you know we've seen that. Now, the idea of a warp drive is uh, something that has gotten attention, you know, from Star Trek. This idea that we could potentially go faster than the speed of light is, uh, is up for debate. Uh, I've seen articles written about people studying it. I don't know how serious they are. Um, the physics do not support us traveling faster than the speed of light. Um, so... Personally, I don't think it's possible. Of course, some people will argue like wormholes in, uh, you know, um, kind of fractures in space and time may, may let us uh, travel from one part of the universe to the other with the appearance of going faster than the speed of light. But uh, I don't think NASA is putting a whole lot of effort into warp drives right now. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. All right. The next set of questions coming on your screen. There they are. Mission Perseverance and the poll is going to be on in a second. Three questions. What is the Perseverance Ranger rover doing on Mars is the first one. What is the source of power for the Perseverance rover and how did the Perseverance rover aim towards the right landing spot? 
Come on, guys. What question do you want him to answer? Which one of the three? Running far ahead. What is the Perseverance rover doing on Mars? Leading the chart. Scott, what is it doing there? Well, it's exploring Mars and it's uh, searching for life in various ways. It's also uh, collecting uh, samples that in a later mission will be returned to Earth. So that's very exciting. It's out there collecting a bunch of different samples, uh, you know, boring uh, samples of, of rock and dirt. Uh, and hopefully there will be signs of life in there once we get them back home, which will really change, I think, our perspective on, uh, you know, our place in the universe. Perseverance also has a helicopter that they've been flying, which I'm very excited about because I'm a test pilot and having the first time ever a, uh, an aerospace vehicle flying on a, another planet is very, very exciting. So it's doing a lot, a lot of science to someday pave the way for us as humans to, to follow. Fantastic, fantastic. So much to learn on this platform, guys, but more questions to follow set five that's in the news and in the news falcon 9 rocket landing artemis program james webb space telescope i'm going to the poll now come on guys what do you want to know from our main man here well it's just running away ahead isn't it falcon 9 rocket landing scott so i guess uh that's not really a question but i guess you the question is tell tell a little bit about it so falcon 9 was designed by uh, SpaceX, uh, head, headed by Elon Musk. And when he said he was gonna land the first stage of that rocket on a barge, on a ship, uh, I thought he was crazy. I dismissed it. NASA looked at that and said, you know, it's too, it's too hard, too complicated. Uh, we're not gonna try to do that. But he went and told everyone he was gonna do it, and then he did it, and he did it again and again and again. And then we have some of these Falcon 9 rockets. I don't know. I think the longest one, the one that's flown the most might, might be 10 times. Um, and that allows us to lower the cost of getting into space when you can reuse the first stage of the rocket and make space flight, you know, someday more accessible to more, uh, more people on this planet. So what Elon has done and SpaceX has done is very exciting. And he says he's going to Mars someday. And I said he was crazy when he would was going to land that rocket. And I will never say again that Elon is crazy. <laughs> well, thank you for those lovely answers and insight into, into the world of space, which is above and beyond. Now, Scott, you faced uh, numerous challenges in your life and you've overcome them and you've come out shining. The question is, can you handle the rapid fire round. We're going to be asking you questions where you have to answer them quick and fast and give us the answers of a few set of questions that, uh, well, our young adults here would like to know. So rapid fire with Scott. I'm excited. I know all our young friends out there are. Here it goes. Now, first question. Does space have a distinct smell as you move into the International Space Station? Well, the space station smells. Uh, it depends on where you are. It smells like... Uh, if you're near the garbage, it might smell like garbage. If you're where we work out, it might smell like sweat. Uh, but I think what you're getting at is, does the vacuum of space smell? Yes. And when you open the hatch and the volume where the hatch was, was previously at vacuum, and now it has air in it, that air has a smell to it. And it smells like, uh, I, I kind of describe it as like burnt metal. Maybe the smell is if you've ever been around someone who was welding metal, or mm -hmm. maybe the sparklers that you might see on a holiday, New Year's Eve, like yeah. fireworks on the 4th of July has that kind of smell to it. Other people des describe the smell more, I think it's person dependent, like mm -hmm. burnt meat, but it's a distinct smell that um, you'll never, never forget. Thank you for that. The next question, does the moon look away from the International Space Station more than it does from the Earth? Does it look away? Yeah. It looks similar. It's, uh, you know, you're not looking through the atmosphere, so it's a little bit more brilliant. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the moon looks similar. All right. If you had the opportunity to go to Mars, 
what would you be most interested in seeing? Oh, I mean, you know, I've never been asked that question. I, I would just love to be part of the mission, part of the team, part of the experience. Perfect. Which aspect of the research that you did during your stay that excited you the most? I liked working with the mice. They were very challenging, uh, doing experiments with little mice. They actually behave much like humans do in space. In the beginning, they're not too comfortable, and then they get better at floating around. Perfect. What's your advice for young kids interested in space and science? Well, I think if you're work, interested in working in the space industry, you know, prioritize your education. Uh, if you're interested in being an astronaut, it's important not only to do well in your chosen career field, but also have other skills, show that you can work as part of a team, leadership, uh, dealing with harsh conditions uh, like you might deal with in space. If you had to go for short durations, do you prefer being in space more or in Earth more? In what? Wait, say that again. Would you prefer being in space more or do you prefer being on the Earth more? I'd go to space in a second, but I wouldn't go to Mars if I couldn't come home. I'd go on a Mars mission, but I, I like Earth. Earth's got a lot of good stuff about it. There's some bad things about it, too, yeah. but it's totally good. Well, there's nothing bad about this session. Thank you so much once again, Scott, for being out here. And I can tell you with the amount of emojis and the amount of people who are, who are kind of uh, you know, sending in and showing you a lot of love, this was truly insightful. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And Scott, I believe there's a special um, call out message that you have as well for all the young adults out there with regards to the hackathon. Oh, yeah. So there's this hackathon. And I just want to let all the kids know that you continue can continue your space adventures by joining the uh, Mission Mars Hackathon. It's a special competition uh, where you're thrust into this problem uh, solving where you have to quickly uh, solve uh, hackable challenges in a very short period of time, uh, you know, and I think the people that are going to be successful at that are the ones that look at things from kind of unique uh, perspectives, different perspectives uh, with your own unique style. So I encourage all the coders out there to enjoy uh, or to join this exciting hackathon mission. Thank you so much for those uh, last words there, Scott. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on this platform. And I can tell you that uh, I don't know about the kids, but I know about the kids have enjoyed themselves, but I've thoroughly had a great time. Thank you so much for all the insight into the world of space. And we look forward to having you once again to tell us lots more. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Samir. Thank you. Take care. Kids. See you next time. There he is, is the man, Scott Kelly, who's been out here. What an amazing guy. What amazing adventures and what a life he's lived going through these wonderful experiences. But I can tell you that the fun on this session will continue. Are you guys having a good time? First of all, keep sending in those emojis. I wish I could hear you and talk to each and every one of you. But for now, we'll keep those emojis coming. I can say one thing, guys. This is an amazing concept. It's a unique amalgamation of fun and learning. To all the folks watching us on YouTube, guys, are you having a good time? Yes, you are? I'm sure you are. Now would be an amazing point to join us live by clicking on the link in the description. Be a part of this fantastic evening even more because Hackathon 101 is about to start and you will be a step closer to embark upon the amazing journey on the red planet and find your way to amazing prizes. I told you earlier, in case you joined late, a PS4 is waiting for you, a MacBook Air and an iPad as well. To take the next session, we have with us Rajiv Jha. Our VP of Curriculum, Rajiv, is an experienced education pioneer working on aspects such as teaching, coaching, design content for diverse disciplines, and developing tech-based tools to aid learn. At present, he is actively exploring game design and also learning sciences. Along with Rajiv, we will have Narita Mohan and Vishnu Priya. Can we have them on stage, please? There he is. Hi, Rajiv. How's hi. it going, buddy? Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank and you for the introduction. Yeah. Yes, great to have you guys out here. Hackathon 101. And I believe there's going to be a unique way of uh, telling us about this hackathon. We got Vishnu, we got Narita, and of course, Rajiv, all three of them. Thank you guys for being out here. Now, Rajiv, uh, I, I won't make the audience wait for too long because I know they want to know how to ace the hackathon. 
Hackathon 101 is live. Over to you, Rajiv. Call me when you're done with your presentation. All right? Yeah. Have a good one. Thank you, Sumi. So, uh, guys, as you know, good evening from this part of the world, first of all. Um, as you guys know, uh, White Hat Junior and Reduce Future School is launching its first hackathon for this year, which is called Mission Mars. I have with me here two former White Hat Junior and Reduce Future School coding teachers, but who are currently core members of White Hat Junior curriculum team and who also helped design this year's Mission Mars hackathon. So I welcome Narita and, and Vishnupriya here. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. So to our audience who might not know what a hackathon is, can some can one of you describe what a hackathon is? Yes, of course. To understand what a hackathon is, you have to first understand what a hacker is. So do you know what a hacker is? Uh, from what I know, a hacker is someone who gets into someone else's computers, who breaks into someone else's computers and steals information. Definitely not. No, not at all. It's not really that. A hacker is someone who can actually exploit any system for that point to get more out of that system than what it is actually designed for. And you know what? A good hacker can get any system to behave exactly like the way they want. Uh, but Priya, I feel a computer hacker is only a small subset of hackers who breaks into others' computers. So the term hacker has a more broader perspective, isn't it? So what you're saying is hacker is someone who can take any system, not only computers, and get it to behave the way they want. Am I hearing it right? Yeah, absolutely. Can, can you share an example to help us understand better? Oh, of course, definitely. I would love that. And I'm going to tell you this very famous hacker story of all times. So listen to the story very well. There was a crow which was very, very thirsty. And it actually was searching for water all around. And you know wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. I, I know the story. Is this the same story where the crow throws the drops pebbles in a pot of water to raise its level and then drinks the water? Yes, absolutely right. Do you mean to say the crow here is a hacker? Of course, the crow is a hacker here. Because you know, the pot is not designed for the crow to drink water. Because the water level is very low. So what did the crow do? It simply hacks the system to get water to the desired level by throwing some pebbles into the pot and quench its thirst. So in fact, the thirsty crow here is a role model for all the hackers out there. This is why we are made to learn this story at school right from our kindergarten. Right. OK, I understand now. I understand what the word hacker means. And I'm just wondering if there are times when we have hacked things without realizing we are acting as hackers. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I feel everyone over here are hackers now. When your mom actually makes ropes out of braided saris, she's definitely a hacker. Or when your dad uses his smartphone as a mirror, he's even a hacker, isn't it? I'm sure everyone in the audience here is a hacker too. If you spend some time thinking about what are those moments where you have changed the system to behave in a different way than it actually was designed for, you have hacked things already. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Not only all hackers do it for a bad purpose, there are some very good hackers who use some amazing hacking techniques to get the most out of a system than actually what it is designed for. OK, now that we know what a hacker is, can we get back to the original question? What is exactly a hackathon again? That is a very, very important question now. So let me explain that. You know, just like a marathon is a kind of a contest for athletes to test their stamina and strength. Similarly, a hackathon is a problem solving contest for hackers to test their ingenuity and creativity. And yet yeah, that's what a hackathon is. Absolutely. And a hackathon is designed on the principle so that the best come to, comes out of the hacker when the constraints are very limited, like the knowledge, time and the resources. So what, what we're saying is that hackathon is an event where you have limited time, limited knowledge, limited resources at your disposal to solve a problem. And this somehow brings the best in you and best in all hackers. Absolutely. Yes, of course. A well-designed hackathon, you know, pushes the boundaries of all the participants and they end up learning and doing much more 
than they thought was possible in a limited period of time. Amazing. Right. I, I am now excited to be part of this hackathon. Uh, tell us more about Mission Mars hackathon, which you had designed. Definitely. But before I even start about the Mission Mars hackathon, I'm sure you have played the very first round of this hackathon, which was few days ago, and you had gone through a journey on arriving on planet Mars virtually. But don't worry, if you haven't, <laughs> the window is still open for Mission Mars, and you can still play. Now that you landed on planet Mars and you're driving your rover robot, you are going to leave an amazing mark on the dusky tracks of the planet Mars. Shall we see that? Yes, I'm very excited to see that. Yeah, see you. <laughs> right, let's go for it then. So that is going to be a rover and we have six different commands we can control our rover. The very first command is being the forward command. The forward command will make sure that rover moves forward by the number of steps you want it. Here, I have taken 100, so it will move forward by 100 steps. Isn't it cool? Very nice. Awesome. Let's go with our very next command, the backward command. You can move your rover backward with the number of steps using this particular command. Now, you might be wondering that forward and backward wouldn't make any sense to a signature. So we are coming up with the next interesting command, which is turn left. Turn left will make sure that your rover is turned to a particular direction. And the amount of angle that you want is what you have to put right over there. Similarly, we can go with turn right as well, which is going to turn the rover towards the right side by the amount of angle it wants to go. It's awesome to see our rover move in amazing directions. But do you know that we can stop the rover from creating a trace as well? The lift up command is going to make sure that it doesn't leave any trace by the distance you want to travel it. And when you want to resume your rover back, you're going to use the lift down command with the distance you want it to travel with. This is awesome, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So, so, so in the hackathon event, you have these six commands and you're in control of the rover robot. And by using these commands, you have to somehow create a unique design or a unique mark on the planet Mars. Absolutely. That sounds, that sounds amazing. Can you share us an example of a signature which you created? Definitely. I'm going to show you a signature, but are you ready for the grand reveal? Because it's going to be exciting. Yeah, I, I'm excited. as well. All right. So there you go. Oh, wow. Isn't it this cool? This looks amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you what, Rajiv? This is just 10 lines of code. And, and did you do this using the six commands that you, that you told us? Exactly. But it also changes colors and it looks as if it's moving. You didn't tell us commands for changing colors. Well, in that sense, that's what I'm a hacker, right? In a true sense, hacker make sure that any system can behave exactly like they want, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there is no one stopping you to look at the code and the environment and change the things the way you want and apply your own creativity just like we showed you just now, isn't it? OK, this is, this is amazing. Um, and I'm sure the audience here is excited to be part of this hackathon and experiment with their ideas and designs and use these commands and learn much more than the thing they're capable of. Um, uh, Samir, uh, uh, this was all from our side, uh, but the floor is open for questions which anyone might have on on uh, Mars mission uh, or anything in general for us. Samir. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Narita. And thank you, Vishnu. Well, I'm learning so much today, guys, in a very unique way of making us learn as well. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Narita. Thank you. And um, so now, guys, we're, we're talking about this, this hackathon. I want to ask you guys, I wish I could, first of all, take part and go through this amazing journey and learn so much. Well, that's not possible for me. But it is for all the young students out there. Now, make sure you remember the deadlines and complete the hackathon. Rajiv, I believe there are a few questions which have been asked to us by the students about how we address um, getting into the hackathon. 
bring them a step closer. So I'm going to ask you these questions. Quickly, you can answer them for us. Who can participate in the Mars Mission Hackathon? Well, this hackathon is absolutely open for students who are exactly enrolled at Whitehead by Jews Future Schools, the coding curriculum, but it can be helping. Uh, it can. It is also open for the past students who have been part of this curriculum. Fantastic. Open for all. How can so, I register? So right. anyone anyone who has enrolled for uh, Whitehead Junior or by Jews Future School coding curriculum in present or past uh, is open to enroll for, for the, this hackathon. Okay. I was saying, how can I? Obviously, I can't, but everybody else can. Okay, how, how will I find the link for the hackathon? So the link for the hackathon is going to be in the dashboard of the student if they want to do, right? And uh, we'll also pop up uh, the link if you want as well. Fantastic. What, interestingly, what are the prizes for the Mars Mission Hackathon, guys? Very important. Prizes we need to know. Of course, definitely. The first champion wins a free MacBook Air. The second is going to win an iPad Air, and third is going to win a PlayStation 4. So I'd said it earlier, but now that you guys are saying it, it holds that much more value. All right. Great gifts also to work and play for. Okay. How many days is the event for? So the event starts on 5th of July, 2021, and it ends on 12th of July. Fantastic. What resources do I need for the hackathon? Well, just a PC, laptop, and a good internet connection, I guess. That's it. That's it. Nothing more than that. So easy, simple. What is the problem we will be solving in the hackathon? All right. So we just show you that we created a unique mark on mission, <laughs> on the Mars. That's what exactly. Unique mark to do. Perfect. Virtually. Yes. Fantastic. How many submissions can a student attempt? There will be only one submission per student. Okay. Okay. Perfect. One only. And how are the hackathon projects evaluated? Hackathon will be evaluated by the Whitehead Junior and the Bajus Future School teachers. And it will be, you know, evaluated on four rubrics. First is creativity. That means, you know, how you can think out of the box and come up with a unique solution. And it's going to be an error-free code, like, you know, correct syntaxes and how close to the completion the project is. And of course, last but not the least, how the coding concept was put to good use. So the average of the four rubrics will be the score of the project. Brilliant. And lastly, when will the results be announced? Very, very important. Absolutely. Yes, that's, that's one of the very important questions. It's the 28th July, uh, 2021 at 2 p.m. IS. So guys, what are we waiting for? Let's get into the hackathon. Let's win those prizes. Let's have some fun and uh, let's enjoy this new space and learn a whole lot more. Rajiv, I have an amazing idea. Let's run a five uh, question quiz and see the audience's reaction and uh, to understanding of the same. So you ready for it? Yeah. 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 All right, guys. I'm excited for this. Let's go. We got questions being thrown up. Hackathon questions on your screen. My friends, what is the goal of Mission Mars Hackathon? A, leave your unique mark on Mars. B, reach planet Earth from Mars. C, leave a good flag on planet Mars. Or D, leave a flag on planet Earth. Which way are you guys going? Which way are you guys going? Which way is the poll going? The poll is running. The poll is moving. No, the poll is there on my screen now. All right, all right. 90, oh, it's running away actually. Leaving your unique mark on the dusty planet of Mars. What is the right answer? That is the right answer. Well, our young adults here seem to know enough and more. Speaking of more, we want more. Question number two on our screens. Here it is. Which is the robot you are controlling on the mission Mars? Is it a hover? Is it a rover? Is it a dover? Or is it a drone? Come on, guys. What's the answer? Think, think. You guys want to help them? Give them a clue. Give them a clue. Our three experts out here. If they watched our uh, presentation, they definitely know by now. So the answer is, uh, when you, you were listening, then you'd know it. 92% say rover is the answer. That? Yes, it is. It's a rover. And smiling away. Well, our three experts out here. Very well done. Okay, third question, guys. Third question, quickly. What is the following commands? Which of the following commands are not a part of Mission Mars operation? A, move up. B, forward. C, backward. D, lift up. 
which is not a part of Mission Mars. I want to go to the poll out here. Okay, right. It's on my screen. Move up is what they're saying. What is the right answer? Move up. It is moving up on the wow, our audience is super amazing today. <laughs> yeah, they're in the zone. They're certainly in the zone. Okay, next question. Question number four. When does the final round of Mars mission statement go live? Is it 11th of July? Is it 12th of July? Is it 8th of July? Is it 10th of July? What do you say, folks? Guys, what are you saying? See my poll. Getting closer. It's not taking a toll. The right answer is 12th of July. You can sing it again and again. And yes, the thumbs are up. The thumbs are up. The last question. The last question. That's question number five. How many days do you have to solve and submit the mission mass statement? Think about it. Five days, 70 hours. Two days, 48 hours. One day, 24 hours. Or half day, 12 hours. What do our young ones say? Have they been playing? Have they been paying close attention? I think that they have. I think that they have. The right answer is one day, 24 hours. That's what it takes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys, for helping me with that uh, that set of questions. And I can tell you, we're seeing the poll. Most people, most of the kids out there knew exactly what was going on. So I think they're ready. They're clued on, and they really know what they're installed for. Okay, guys, moving on. Um, once again, I want to remind you all that Mission Mars Quiz is still live. If you haven't taken your quiz yet, you can start right after this event and complete it anytime within the next 11 hours. As for the Hackathon project, it will be live after the next 11 hours. You will have four hours to complete your project. You can submit the project by 11 a.m. Indian Standard Time the next day. That is on the 12th of July. Thank you so much, Rajiv, and his entire team for this lovely walkthrough. And we are sure the students now have the arsenal to take on Mission Mars Hackathon. Thank you guys for joining us on screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. OK. Guys, now as we continue on this Mission Mars journey, we have the next session called Space Science and Exploration with Dr. Carmen Kozarev. Now, Carmen is an astrophysicist and a NASA Living with a Star Jack Eddy postdoctoral fellow. Can we have Dr. Carmen on stage, please? We're going to invite Dr. Carmen on stage and bring him up right here. Hello. Hi, everybody. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's, it's so nice to be on, on the mission to Mars, Agatha. Well, it's great to have you out here, sir. And I can tell you that uh, all the kids are really excited to hear from you. And it's an absolute honor, personally, for me to be sharing this, this virtual stage with you. I believe you have an amazing set of videos and demos lined up for all our lovely kids. So I'm not going to keep you waiting. I'll be backstage. You call me whenever. We'll walk the audience through the quiz, the Q&A, and a whole lot of fun. But the stage is all yours. All right. Thank you, Samir. So first, we would uh, uh, I, I would really love to show you uh, a short little vi little video about solar system exploration in Europe. Uh, and the video is part of uh, an amazing new um, planetarium show uh, called Europe's Cosmic Quest. So um, let's take a look, and then we can talk about it. I don't know if we can uh, show the video that take us out to the solar system. Why do we need all those missions? Well, there are many reasons, uh, but mostly it's because we'd like to get as close as possible to all these um, space um, objects that, that are out there. And, uh, um, and I, I, I truly think it's fascinating how humanity has been able to, uh, to achieve what it has achieved getting all the way millions of kilometers away from the Earth uh, to be able to observe uh, uh, um, objects in the, in the solar system, um, including planets, comets, asteroids, etc., cetera, uh, and the sun. But also, uh, there has been tremendous uh, um, amount of, of achievement and of understanding about our own planet, uh, uh, the Earth. And uh, we'll, of course, talk about this uh, in a little bit. Um, but uh, I don't know if, if Samir can join us uh, on stage, uh, but anyway, um, as I understand, there, uh, 
we uh, should have some uh, a poll based uh, Q and A, uh, and uh, and uh, you would choose the, the questions that I can answer about this interesting video. The full video itself is uh, you know much longer, um, and uh, it's meant to be shown on uh, a planetarium, uh, digital planetarium, um, and it was developed actually in my home city in the uh, Natural History Museum of Plovdiv in Bulgaria, where I'm from. I, uh, as you probably heard in the, in the very beginning, I was able to uh, complete my education in the US. I studied in, uh, in Massachusetts, in Boston University, and then I worked at, uh, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And I, uh, my uh, area of interest uh, is uh, the activity of the so if you have any questions about that, I think there might be some questions actually coming up about the activity of the sun and how it affects the entire solar system. As you saw, this was actually uh, part of the um, you know, part of the of the little uh, video that you saw. So I hope I uh, uh, you really uh, were able to understand a little bit more, or at least to pique your interest in how uh, we are able to explore uh, the solar system. So I don't know if uh, Samir is here. OK. Um, what else can I say? Um, maybe I can, uh, I can uh, start uh, my presentation uh, and tell you a little bit uh, about uh, planets. Um, and how, what their shapes are actually, and the um, the different shapes of uh, solar system objects. Uh, I think it might be interesting, and uh, and I actually have some uh, very nice uh, props that I can uh, probably show you a little bit later. Uh, how does that sound? Is that good? All right, everybody's excited. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm. So very excited, and I'm really excited about your coming up uh, hackathon, uh, which I believe is coming up on the 12th. Um, oh no, it's actually tomorrow. I hope everybody is great and uh, I, uh, and and ready, and I, I think you guys will do fantastic. So let me just share my screen <clears throat> and uh, and begin my uh, presentation actually, and then we can actually do the questions when Samir shows up a little bit later. I don't know, maybe he. Uh, stepped up for, for some water or something. But anyway, uh, let me begin this. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. All right. OK, so let's begin. So I have a little presentation uh, uh, that's um, meant to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the shapes of solar system objects. Um, now, looking at the, that video that you saw, um, it seemed like most objects and of course, from your prior knowledge, it seemed that most uh, objects in the solar system are round. Um, so let's think about it. First of all, why is that? I think, and every and most people think, that it's because of gravity, right? Obviously, gravity is uh, a force that uh, is uh, uh, is meant to pull on the masses. So the uh, when the solar system was formed, um, the most Massive objects were gathering uh, uh, mass, and they were gathering actually other objects from all sides because it's it's sort of a spherically symmetric force. But in reality, uh, things are a little bit different. So let's take a look at the Earth, for example. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen uh, images like this showing the Earth looking like a beautiful round object. But what is the real shape of the Earth? So scientists. Uh, really didn't take uh, these pictures for granted or this information, and they were able to show and to map what the real shape of the Earth is. So here's what they found. Check this out. The real shape of the Earth is a geoid. What is a geoid? Oh, sorry. Maybe I can show you. Okay. All right. All right. So what is a joy? So what you're seeing here is the actual real shape of the Earth 
um, that was discovered by a space mission, nonetheless, that was launched by the European Space Agency. Uh, what you see, and let me know, uh, here we go, India is right in the middle of the screen right now. So what this image shows is an exaggeration of the true shape of the Earth, with the blue colors being the lowest, that means closest to the center of the Earth, and the red and yellow being the ones that are farthest uh, out from the center of the Earth. So obviously when you have oceans and so on, uh, those would be uh, much closer, but you can see India uh, is sort of in the darker blue parts, uh, whereas some other parts such as uh, Europe you can see <clears throat> and actually part of the Atlantic Ocean are much farther out. So that is very interesting. Um, and in fact, I can show you some cool uh, examples. So let me just stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, this is, uh, everyone can see me, right? This is a, a very cool, uh, actually 3D printed uh, geoid. Can you see that? My colleague, Mate uh, Jordan, who is right here with me, he was able to print this fantastic uh, 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 3D object uh, that was, uh, which is based on the findings of an ESA mission that I'm going to show you. And right here, can you see? Right here is India in this in this, this depressed part. So in reality, the Earth doesn't look that crazily misshapen, obviously, right? But it still has a unique, a really unique form. So in reality, it looks something like this, without the ocean. right? Without the oceans, of course. <laughs> obviously, this is is how the Earth would look if it didn't have any oceans, right? So you can see this is also a three-dimensional um, shape that was printed by a 3D printer, and it's super cool. I just wanted to show you that because I think it's it's so nice. All right. Hmm? Um, okay, so let me just share my screen and then continue my uh, presentation. So we were talking about, about the geoid, uh, and it's an amazing scientific finding that, that scientists were able to, uh, to produce. Oh, sorry, one second. OK. So how did they figure this out? Well, they used this super cool, futuristically looking uh, spacecraft that's called GOSI. Uh, and this was a mission uh, that was launched by the European Space Agency. Um, and it was actually used uh, to uh, map the, the gravitational pull of the Earth on the satellite using what's known as an accelerometer, uh, which is a very cool uh, tool or, or, or a little gadget, which most of you actually have in your phone. Whenever you move your phone or rotate your phone, it reacts. So it has a, an accelerometer inside. So this satellite has a, a much more sophisticated, obviously, satellite, um, but it was flying very low uh, and uh, it was able to feel the changes, the very, very tiny changes in the pool of the Earth on the, on the satellite itself. So that's, that's one very cool mission. So um, this uh, event is all about Mars, right? We love Mars. Uh, so here is a similar image um, showing, the, the how, showing what the topology or the different heights of the surface of Mars look like. How is this, uh, how is this uh, found out? Well, um, uh, scientists used um, uh, an instrument called a LIDAR, or uh, um, a laser altimeter, which means basically they shine a laser down at the surface of the planet uh, from a satellite that's orbiting uh, constantly, and it is able to, measuring the, the time it took the light to go down reflect off the surface and return and be detected, they were able to, uh, to measure the height of the different parts of Mars. Uh, so let me show you. I actually have another um, 3D printed version of this. Isn't this cool? Check this out. There you go. So this uh, is a actually a re very realistic model, and it's showing you uh, the, the actual shape of Mars. Of course, we don't find any oceans there. 
which is fine. But you can see here uh, Olympus Mons, which is the this fantastic uh, volcano, which is the tallest uh, um, the tallest volcano in the solar system. And you can see Balas Marineris, which is way way bigger than the Grand Canyon in the United States. So here's another cool cool example. And before uh, I continue, we have even more information. So you can actually see uh, uh, Mercury. This is the real shape of Mercury. And it looks like Swiss cheese. Isn't that crazy? It shows you all the different crater impacts. Um, so scientists are able, using these instruments, to actually study the shapes of the, of the different uh, uh, planets. And this way, we can learn a lot. For example, we can find out where we can land our spacecraft. Uh, obviously, we'd like this to be a nice uh, uh, flat space so it doesn't bounce around um, or, or fall down and break. Right? Um, if you want to learn more about the real shape of Mars, there is a very cool website. I'm showing you the, the URL here. It's a NASA website where they've actually created a virtual three-dimensional object uh, based on the measurements of, of this laser optimeter. And you can actually rotate it, turn it around, uh, uh, and show the different exaggerations. Here, for example, you can see the Olympus Mons, and you can see these uh, uh, lower parts behind it showing that it um, that there was sort of a, a little crater around it as well. So that's extremely cool. Okay, so let's move on to comets, which is another extremely interesting topic, uh, like where do comets from, uh, come from, uh, what do they look like, and uh, uh, are they going to show up uh, close to the Earth? Uh, did they spread life? There are all these exciting questions. So this image on the left shows you um, what a real comet, or let's say the nucleus of a real comet looks like, uh, as seen from very, very close up. Uh, and then this image on the right uh, actually shows you what a comet looks when it approaches uh, the sun, when it uh, dives very close to the sun, attracted by its gravity. So this is, okay, I'll show you a video actually of a comet approaching, uh, approaching the, um, the, the sun. And this is Comet Ison, uh, also known Comet C3, C3, I believe it's called. Uh, and this one did really end its life getting close to the sun. So check this out. Here's a comet that was a solar eruption, coronal mass ejection. Gets close to the sun, goes super fast, and then little by little is dissipated and disappeared. What happened there? Well, all of its material was actually uh, sublimated. It evaporated instantly from uh, the surface of the comet. So I can I can even show you a cool example. But first, actually, let's finish this off. So how are comets studied? Uh, well, uh, we fortunately have these amazing uh, uh, technical advances that allow us to send a satellite. Uh, that can actually orbit a comet or the, 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 the um, nucleus of a comet. And uh, this particular mission called Rosetta, uh, which was uh, done by the European Space Agency, it, it was actually able to send a little lander that landed on the surface and was able to record valuable information. Um, so, I, yeah, so the next question is what are comets made of? Uh, and I will address this in just a second. Ho hopefully, it will be uh, very interesting to you. Um, but at the same time, uh, I also wanted to show you another three-dimensional. Um, uh, OK. Here, I, I just wanted to, this is so cool. Check this out. So scientists were able to map using the same exact uh, tools uh, we're able to map the comet Churum of Gerasimenko, which I just showed you. Uh, and this is the actual three-dimensional shape, uh, or a model of, a, of the three-dimensional shape of a real, actual comet that was visited in 2014 um, by uh, the European uh, Rosetta mission. Isn't that very cool? 
So we know what they look like, but what are they made of, right? This is a very, very interesting question. Well, actually, I can show you right here how you uh, or anyone really can make uh, a comment or the, let's say the nucleus of the comment, the what are the main materials? Let's try to put them together. All right. Let's see if this will work. Okay. Okay. I'm going to put my apron on. Can you guys hear me? Hopefully you can hear me. All right. So here I have with me the uh, different ingredients of, of an actual comment. Let me just pull this a little bit closer. Uh, what I should have done this way. All right. So what do we have here? We have uh, the receptacle where we will be putting together the comet. All right. What are the main ingredients of a comet? Let's start with some water. Okay. So we have nice liquid water. I hope everyone is writing down the ingredients because it's a recipe, people. Uh, okay. So we're going to put some water in. What else goes inside the water, uh, inside the comet? Well, actually, um, materials, uh, silicates, uh, rocks, and so on, which will represent with some um, um, sand. I hope you can see this. Okay, so we put some sand inside. All right, it's looking great already. Um, okay, then apparently scientists also found that there's ammonia. So we don't have pure ammonia, but we have some cleaning liquid of which I'll put in a little bit. All right. Mmm, smells fantastic. Okay. Um, there is also alcohol. So we have a little bit of, of uh, ethyl alcohol that I'm going to put in a little bit. All right, not too much. Okay. Then um, there is also graphite. Graphite is uh, basically pure carbon, uh, and that that represents all the different uh, carbon uh, carbon compounds. Um, and it also is what gives the comets the very dark uh, appearance. Um, I don't know if you can see this, um, but graphite is very dark. So I'm going to take a little bit of graphite and stick it in there. Okay. All right. And here is here comes a very interesting part. Um, apparently, in the last years, there were a lot of organic uh, uh, compounds, organic uh, molecules that were actually long chains, um, and many people think may be the source of life. So I'm going to uh, substitute those uh, with soy sauce, actually, and <laughs> which is also full of organic molecules. So I'm going to put a little bit of that inside. And then, since uh, comets are actually um, uh, out in the, in the dark, cold space, uh, we're going to put some um, dry ice. And I'm going to take some precautions right here. Put in my gloves. Dry ice is extremely cold. It's at a temperature of minus 80 degrees. Okay, so I put on my gloves. And we're going to take a little bit of dry ice. Okay. And just put it in there. Ooh. Check this out. All right. So this is what is happening right now. We're getting, let's put some more. All right, the dry ice is getting in there and is rapidly, extremely rapidly, uh, extremely rapidly cooling everything down. So what we're going to do is we're going to mix it all up uh, a little bit right here. It's cooling down the water and it's creating this uh, sort of homogeneous um, a homogeneous object, which is going to form the, uh, which is going to form the nucleus 
of our uh, of our comment. Let me put a little bit. Here. All right. So these these object comments, um, uh, as you will see in a second, they they are driving riding around space all the time, and they're actually. Um, not so homogeneous. They they look like just the ice that I just put in there. They they are dirty dirty snowballs. Let's see if it's ready. If you guys can see, it's still it's still cooling down. All right. Ooh, it's magical. So let's see. All right, let's take it out. Ooh, look at that. Can you see this? It's the dark, dark core of a comet, right? It has everything. It has the ice. It has the carbon. It has a little bit of ammonia. It has the uh, the alcohol, and most importantly, the organic molecules. And it's very solid. What else is happening here? It's sublimating, right? So this is actually CO2. The dry ice is actually uh, carbon dioxide, which is sublimating, which is exactly what happens when these comets get very close to the sun. Okay, so this is how we make it. And perhaps you could do this with your science teacher at school. You just have to find some dry ice and some of the other ingredients. Okay, so um, this is my uh, presentation. This is my demonstration. So maybe we can get Samir uh, on stage and start uh, answering some questions. I hope you enjoyed this. Do we have Samir? Right here, Carmen. Right here. Hey, hey, hey. how's it going, Carmen? I think uh, you know not only are the young minds blown out there, my mind is blown. You just created a comet right in front of us using your hands. That's incredible. My God, what should we call this? Carmen, what 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 should we call this comet? Let's give it a name. I don't know. I don't know. Why why don't the students suggest some name? <laughs> All right, write it out. Suggest a name for the comet that Kamen has just created in front of us. That's just incredible. There it is. There it is. Looking lovely. And just multiply this into about a billion times its size, and it's out there in space, right? That's right. Well, Kamen, it's incredible. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for showing us how this works, how this is formed. The comet is formed. And I can tell you what you've just shown us right now. The questions have been unleashed. It is them <laughs> out there with the number of questions that have come to us. We know how valuable your time is. We're going All to right. run poll on the questions and, and make sure we pull out those questions that everybody wants answers to. But before we get into those, I want to make, um, make sure we all know that the hackathon is on the 11th of July. That's when it opens up. It closes on the 12th of July, guys. That means you have a 24-hour window to submit your project. Remember that. 11th, it opens. 12th. It closes. But right now, we open the questions, we unleash the questions, and the polls shall also be unleashed to know which questions you guys want answered the most. All right, on our screen, set one, know about the sun. I'm going to open my poll out here, Carmen, and let's see what they want to hear, what they want to know most about the sun. What are solar flares and how often do they happen? How has the sun evolved and how has that impacted the planets? And what is the biggest mystery about the sun that mankind is trying to solve? Well, we're going to solve this poll very close. Yeah, 46%. We'll be close by 45, 45. Quick five seconds, guys. Four, three, two, one. Okay. What is the biggest mystery about the sun that mankind is trying to solve? Come in. Over to you. I was hoping that they would choose this question because mysteries are always fun. So there are actually two huge mysteries. Uh, the biggest mystery, perhaps is how does the sun tick? In other words, what drives the solar dynamo? Um, and this is uh, basically what generates the large scale magnetic field of the sun. Um, and it's what drives the solar activity, uh, the solar eruptions that we saw on the video. Uh, this is a question that has not been solved definitively. And uh, maybe a, a little tinier question, uh, which is also a mystery to us, is how does the sun get so hot in its atmosphere? Uh, its surface is around 5,000 uh, degrees uh, Kelvin, but its corona, what we see during solar eclipses, 
uh, get to millions of degrees. So how does this happen? We still don't know. We still don't know. We're trying to figure this out. Carmen, I got to tell you, I'm going to get into trouble with my wife today because of you. Because I'm going to go back home after this and wake up my six-year-old son who's going to be in a sleep, post his sleeping hours, and start giving him all this information that you've given me. I want to share it with him. Anyhow, the second set of questions on your screen. Here they are. Understanding solar missions, guys. What were the key findings of the Ulysses mission? What were the key findings of the SOHO mission? And how has space tech evolved from Ulysses to SOHO to Solar Orbiter? The poll is on, guys. The poll is on. What do you want to know the most? Which one do you want to know the most? 77%. Well, it goes with how has space tech evolved from Ulysses to SOHO to Solar Orbiter? Fantastic. Our young engineers are interested in tech. <laughs> how surprising. <laughs> this is a great question. Uh, uh, thanks for that. Um, and so, Actually, you might be surprised that uh, technology in, uh, in space is quite conservative. And that is because space, as uh, astronaut Scott Kelly explained, is not a very nice place for us uh, or for our electronics. Uh, it means that there are a lot of risks that when you spend so much money on a satellite, let's say, and launch it into space, it will not work. Um, if you haven't tested it before. So they have what's known as flight proven hardware. Uh, so, um, and, and also for computers, they actually use computers that have been tested over and over and over again. So progress is incremental. Uh, it doesn't move uh, that much, even though there have been uh, you know, cell phones, uh, smartphones flown into space and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it's generally quite risky to do that. So, in terms of observations of the sun, uh, there, of course, has been uh, quite a lot of progress. Um, but it's mostly these little small things that help us to achieve better resolutions of the images and the, uh, and the videos that we produce, uh, or better observations with uh, a better uh, um, resolution of the solar wind. Uh, we are able to look into more directions and so on and so forth. But overall, the, the type of, types of experiments that are launched into space are quite similar. Of course, there are some very, very cool uh, new things like those laser altimeters I talked about, that using those, we're able to measure the heights of uh, 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 planets. Um, but yeah. That's how it's evolved, and it's continually evolving from what Common says. Yeah. Next, questions, Common, coming our way on our screen now are planets. That's set number three. What defines whether a planet has a natural satellite or not? Which two planets in the solar system are of most interest to us and why? And how do life related molecules transmit across space? Let's have a look at the poll and see which way people want to flow with this one. It's quite even Stevens right now, Carmen. It seems like we don't have the answers to them all, but we don't have time. For that. Okay, 59%. Which two planets in the solar system are of most interest to us and why, Common? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, and the answer is, might sound a little bit obvious, but to me, right, since you're asking me, I'll answer the top, the top planet that is most important to us is the Earth, right? Because we live on it and we want to keep it nice uh, and safe uh, and, and hospitable to us, but also we want to preserve it. Um, and for us and for the future generation. So definitely number one is the planet Earth. Um, and that's why all the space agencies are launching missions to actually look back, not just at space, but look at the Earth and how it's evolving and how what we can do to actually preserve. So that's number one. Number two, well, Mars, right? <laughs> This is Mission Mars. Mars is uh, one of the closest planets to us, uh, and it's the one that looks the most like Earth. Obviously, it's a smaller planet, uh, and it has uh, a much more rarefied atmosphere, um, and it doesn't have a strong magnetic field to protect it from, uh, from the harmful uh, space radiation and the effects of the solar activity. But it's very close to us, so uh, and and it has a similar uh, a similar look, um, and uh, and that's why we are so eager to uh, to explore it. We're able to land on it, obviously. Uh, everyone knows, uh, and we're actively looking for those uh, signs of life 
did they exist or do they exist even now? Uh, and those are very cool questions that, that we should answer. But it certainly are. And the questions continue and they keep getting cooler, Carmen. The next one, well, it's, they're going to they're pick a planet of their choice. Which planet do they want to talk about? Is it Mars? Is it Saturn? Is it the dwarf planet of Pluto? Is it Jupiter? Is it Venus? Which guys, which, which planet do you guys want to know about the most? I think they're tilting towards Mars. <laughs> Mars, aren't they? I think it's Mars all the way. Let's let's chat about Mars, Carmen. Tell us, tell us more about Mars. So I can tell you something very interesting about uh, the, why Mars is so challenging to us uh, to explore uh, from the perspective, from my perspective as a solar scientist. Um, and so, but to do that, let me take a step back. Uh, I mentioned already that the sun is very active, right? The sun constantly emits these huge clouds of plasma and magnetic fields into the interplanetary space. And they move at extremely high velocities, uh, maybe hundreds to several thousand kilometers per second. Uh, they, these, imagine these billion tons of plasma. And it also has this activity, which is basically spitting out these huge clouds once, one at a time. They also travel throughout the solar system and they interact with planets. Now on Earth we have this, what's known as the magnetosphere, which is the magnetic field of the Earth, which, which is uh, uh, fending off those, uh, those huge clouds of, uh, of ionized gas. But on Mars, for some reason, um, the, the source of the, of the magnetic field on Earth, which is again a dynamo, which is the liquid core of the Earth, does not work. For some reason, uh, the, the core, the, the molten core, doesn't exist on Mars. So that means that there isn't an active magnetic field. Uh, and so it's much easier for those clouds to take away parts of the atmosphere of Mars, which we now know they have done for a long time. Uh, and it's also much easier for space radiation, these very high energy particles uh, launched from the sun that were produced, accelerated during solar eruptions to actually reach uh, the surface of, of Mars. It's actually a vicious cycle. The more uh, atmosphere you remove from the planet, uh, from, from the planet itself, the easier, the easier it becomes for those uh, tiny particles, ions, protons, electrons, to actually reach the surface of the planet and to impact our rovers, uh, our landers, our, uh, the electronics that we launch, or the people that may one day uh, set foot and live on the surface of Mars. So this space radiation is actually a big problem for Mars. And it's something that, that we're hoping to, to discover. I thought, I mean, I hope this is interesting enough. What's more than interesting to me, just to imagine that beyond the atmosphere of our Earth, there's a whole new set of activities across the world that are happening and they've been going on for so many years. And yeah. Study is immense and it's just unsurmountable to the amount we can learn from it. Yeah. Um, next question, next set of questions. No, the comments, no, thy comments, in fact. Uh, well, he made one in front of you. I think you know all about making them, but let's find out where do they come from? Uh, what are the key findings from comet exploration and how do comets get their names? What do you guys want to know? Simple. It's uh, all the way where do comets come from? <laughs> of course, we, that's the first thing we want to know about them. So comets, uh, as this was mentioned in the video that we saw in the very beginning, but comets are actually uh, thought to originate from uh, this thing known as the Oort Cloud. And it's based after, it's named after a Dutch astrom astronomer who was looking at the directions of the comets, uh, where they were coming from. And so he came up with this theory that there's a huge, huge rarefied cloud of, of these uh, comets, stuff like this, right? This is what they look like far away from the sun, um, very far away, uh, about a thousand to 10,000 times the distance between the sun and the earth, or uh, what's known as 10,000 uh, um, astronomical units. Um, and so it's actually spread out um, throughout space. So from any direction, you could get these long period comets of tens and hundreds and thousands of years uh, to come uh, attracted, perturbed by the motion of the planets. Every once in a while, they will be attracted to the sun uh, and then do a swing by and maybe never show up again. Maybe 
uh, all of their material will evaporate. Maybe not. Maybe they'll be able to come back again uh, at some point uh, in their life, or maybe they will end it. Uh, but these are the long period comets um, coming from all directions, and then there are the short period comets, uh, which actually uh, have a, an elliptical trajectory, and they're thought to come from sort of close to the to the ecliptic, the uh, equatorial plane of the, of the solar system. Wow. That is some incredible information to take back. Now, I'm going to ask you, has the comet that you've made evaporated or is it still around next to you? It's still here. Still here? Yeah, I don't know if you can see it well. There is a, there is actually a little bit of, of, of ooh, look at that. There's a little bit of water ice forming just from the uh, the water in the air that's, uh, that's actually uh, uh, attaching to the surface. But it's still here. And it's looking actually better and better. And we're still searching for a name of it. For all you young adults out there, if you send in the most unique name for it, a prize from my side for you, 100%, a comment that we have created live on our session right now. And with that, we come to the end of the Q&A with Carmen. But we still have to throw out some questions at you. Carmen, there's some questions. They're going to be part of a quiz. Let's see how carefully and how closely they have listened to what you have said. Let's see how much they've imbibed. Now, we're talking about some very smart kids out here who are asking these tremendous questions. They know a lot. They're yearning to learn more and more on a daily basis. So we got a quiz. We got a quiz coming up. Guys, are you ready for your quiz? The third round of a quiz? The final round of a quiz? All right. Here it is on your screen. Let's get it out. Which planet has seen most number of missions compared to any other planet? Mercury, Mars, Venus, Jupiter. The poll is on. The poll is on. Mars is 86%. Come on, I don't think we should give them any hints on this one. No, no, no I think it's pretty obvious here. No? Pretty obvious. And the answer is Mars. Yes, indeed. Our young adults are listening and they're paying close attention. Well, 3% actually said Venus. That should be sometime soon or far away. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if I want to go there. It's pretty nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if the next question is nasty or is it fun. Um, where is the asteroid belt? Is it between the Sun and Mercury, between Mars and Jupiter, at the end of the solar system, or is it around Jupiter? Want to give them a hint? Come on. Maybe. Well, it's not quite at the end of the solar system. That's where the Oort cloud is. So that's cancelled. C is cancelled. So I think, yeah. The 10% the, the or the 12% there are diminishing quick and fast. <laughs> and uh, well, they're leading all towards between Mars and Jupiter. Let's see what the right answer is. That is yeah. indeed correct. Our young minds are spot on. Yeah, Next, question. Right. Next question on your screen, guys. What are comets mostly made up of? Have you been watching? Have you been watching our man coming? Is it dirty ice and dust? Is it mixture of gases? Is it molten rock slash hot lava? Or is it the liquid water? All right, no tips here. They saw it happen. They saw it. There's a comet <laughs> next to you, which you have created with your bare hands. You <laughs> of comets. All right. There it is. Let's, let's see if this will help. It will help. It's the first thing you put on. 92% leaning towards dirty ice and dust. And the answer is dirty ice and dust. Salute you, great minds. You've been listening very well. Okay, next question. Next question, Carmen. How many moons does Mars have? Ooh, it gets tricky, it gets interesting. None, two, Deimos and Phobos, two, Oberon and Titania, or is it D1, Calypso? All right. Titania. I think they will, will do very well. I don't think they need the hands on Is there this. any help out here? Well, the answer, the correct answer is two, Demios and Phobos. How many got that right actually in the poll? 91. Oh, now, now they've all got 91%. Post the answer, they've all gone there. They know everything about Mars, I'm sure. They do, they do. Fifth question on your screens, my dear young friends. Which of these planets is the smallest? Is it Earth, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury? Quick on it. Quick on it. All right. So I think we can safely say that it's not Jupiter. It's not Jupiter. It is not Jupiter, my friends. One eliminated by the great man Carmen himself. And the correct answer is 
Mercury, yes. the smallest, yes. smallest of the lot. And with that, end of five questions. And Kamana, I think you'd be pretty impressed with the way the polls were going. They were getting it pretty much bang on, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Great job, guys. Great job. Great job. <laughs> for a hackathon. Yeah, hackathon. 11th and 12th. You know, Kamana, before we move on, a question I'd like to ask you. So much of our reference to space and the above and the beyond is through movies and the shows that we watch. When you watch all these movies based on sci-fi that Hollywood makes about space and about the interstellar and the travel and gravity, how accurate are they? Or how far off are they? Well, I think they've started to make them more and more accurate, like movies like uh, uh, Gravity. Uh, for example, uh, I, th I thought that was a very well-made movie or interstellar, things like that. The way they showed the, the, the black hole in that movie. Uh, but it, this is all because of technologies, right? We've been able to, uh, to do it better and better. But sometimes you just want to lean back and enjoy the story uh, and the characters. So I try not to, to, to pay too much attention because it will really spoil the rest of, of the experience for me. But you do know what's going on. And we know that you know what's going on all throughout. And now we got to move ahead because we got some very special kids who are going to bring on out here on this screen. And they have some questions to ask you. They've been doing exceptionally well. Um, this is us. Th this is now our 18 under 18 winners. And they have amazing teachers who have seen them evolve throughout their journey. Now, 18 under 18 is uh, common. We believe these kids have amazing questions for you, as I said. First up, we have Arvind S. Arvind S, an Abacus national level winner, a winner in chess competitions in the district level. He can also solve six types of Rubik cubes. Along with him, we have his teacher, Megha. Where are you, genius? There you are, six types of Rubik cubes. I can't do half. I can't get one side right. That's incredible. Can we have Arvind and Megha up on stage, please? Do we have Megha here as well? All right, all right, Arvind. We believe. First of all, how are you doing, Arun? Hello, sir. How are you doing, my friend? Are you doing well? Yes, I'm. I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm. I'm great. I'm very amazed at the fact that you can solve the Rubik's cube and you're doing exceptionally well. Now, I believe you have a question for yes. Trump. What is the question you yes. have? What kind of signal do we receive from the space, and how do we decode it? Decoding of signal from the space. Can you repeat what kind of sig signal do we receive from spacecraft? From the space, yes, outer space. And how do we decode them? Yeah. Oh, from in, in general from space? Um, it's general so, from space, not from satellites. Okay, yeah, that's a fantastic question. And that actually uh, brings us into uh, an area that's very dear to my heart, which is radio astronomy. So obviously, you know, when we talk about signal, we usually mean radio signal. But, uh, but, but of course, it's only part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and we signal is also light that we observe with our telescopes uh, on Earth, in space. Uh, but in terms of radio signal, there are some fascinating uh, signals coming uh, to Earth that we are trying to observe with radio telescopes, uh, things like pulsars, these pulsating uh, uh, stars. Uh, um, the, the neutron stars um, and the, their great emissions coming from our galaxy, in fact, uh, from uh, um, supernova remnants, uh, active galaxies. Uh, and there are these things known as fast radio bursts, which we don't even know where they're coming from. Uh, something is very cool is that the sun is also emitting a lot of radio. Uh, emissions that we can also catch with our radio telescopes. And in fact, we know that there is a, a solar uh, eruption, a coronal mass ejection, just by looking at the spectra of the radio emissions that come to us. So it's really a whole zoo of, of observations that we can do, just like we can observe in ultraviolet, in X-ray, um, and invisible lights. Okay, how do we decode it? decoding of signal, if signal has any information. So it's not, we, we assume that it's natural, so we don't think it's actually coded in the first place, right? But what happens is radio telescopes, they observe uh, the, 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 the emission coming in the form and they detect it 
as uh, uh, basically as voltages, right? So we have our nice antennas that we also use to communicate with satellites. We have these antennas that detect the, the changing voltage, uh, and we convert that into intensity, into the brightness on the sky. So that's how we do it. It's just like the communications we do with our satellites. Did you get your answer out of it? Yes, I get it. Is there any particular signals that you're waiting for from space? Yes, uh, from alien signal. But I have especially doubt because yes, we got some signal from Proxima Centauri. What about that? The SS Vinyl News about that. I don't know about that one. I need to look it up. If you know something, don't hold it back. Tell us all. Okay, Keep that's it. Information you have as well with us. We believe your teacher was also supposed to be out here, Mega. Is she here? She's not here on the screen, but I can tell you she's been telling us some really wonderful things about you, Arvind. She's been saying you're a star in the making yourself. You're going to fly right orbit into space with the exceptional work that you're doing. You keep doing the great job that you're doing, and we'll keep felicitating you lots and lots more on this platform. Thank you for joining us, buddy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Rubik's Cube. Please. Huh? Okay, fine. Thank you. There, there he is, Arvind Daf, our first achiever uh, who's done exceptionally well. And a pretty interesting question at that comment, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can talk about radio astronomy forever. There's so much, and there is so much that is not explored. It's, it's really amazing. Well, let's get on our next achiever now on this uh, very stage. His name is Pratham. He is a state level winner for UC Mass Abacus and Arithmetic Competition. He is also interested in coding. Can we have Pratham and his teacher Rakhi Pal on stage, please? Pratham, where are you, my dear friend? I saw him at the start. He was backstage. He was figuring out his, his headphones and his sound. No, this is another Pratham. Hi, Pratham. How's it going? Too good. Too good? Yes. Oh my God, if it's going too good, then it must be really, really nice. But listen, yeah. congratulations on all the great work that you're doing. And I believe you also have a great question for Carmen, who's on the screen now. Yes. Why don't you ask a question? Okay. Um, uh, is the universe potentially infinite? Uh, can we say that uh, other intelligent life exists somewhere within it? Uh, that's my question. Sorry, could you repeat that? I couldn't hear it. I heard the first part. Is the universe potentially infinite? Yeah. Can we safely say that the other intelligent life exists somewhere within it? Does other intelligent life exist because the universe is infinite? Come on. It's a big loaded question coming your way. Are you going to answer it for all of mankind today? Tell us once and for all. Thank you. <laughs> wow. No, a light burden on my shoulders. <laughs> Thank you, Pratham. This is a fantastic question. So the universe is not uh, is not infinite. It is finite, uh, but it just doesn't have an end. Uh, so space-time is curved, and even if you travel in a straight line, you would potentially at some point in the very, very distant future uh, uh, show up at the first place. So it's not infinite. It, it, Perhaps because it had a beginning right during the Big Bang, so we know it has been expanded. Uh, but it's not. what is beyond that uh, uh, universe, we really don't know uh, as scientists. But uh, it's still enormous, right? It's so big. And to think that we are the only life form in this immense universe, I think uh, that I have a great quote uh, from somebody, I forget. Uh, but if the universe is so big and, and it's just us, then it's a huge waste of time, don't you think? Uh, uh, space, I mean, space and time is the same thing. Um, so, so, yes, I think there are other forms of life. Uh, I don't know that they exist in the solar system, but I'm confident that uh, thousands and thousands of uh, extra solar planets or planets outside of the solar system we will very soon uh, be able to find a system which is good uh, to support life. And, and, and then we can uh, focus our attention on exploring it further, learning more, and, and finding out in detail whether indeed there are some signs of life. So 
So I'm really hopeful that uh, hopefully in our lifetimes we can we can actually get to do a mailing. Colin, he is young. By the time he grows up, who knows where space travel has gone to. Maybe he will be one of the first people to go out and look for that other intelligent life up there somewhere in the above and beyond. Ratham, would you like to do that? Yeah. He's thinking about it. Maybe we'll just stick to math for a while, you know, and crack some lovely math solved uh, questions and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's ready to develop a hyperspace travel. Yeah, yeah. In this is your teacher here as well. We have, we're supposed to have... Uh, Rakhi Pal, your teacher out here, is she going to be joining us? Well, we don't know. We don't know right now, but she might join us a little later. But she also had wonderful, tremendous things to say about you and the development and the progress that you're making. So good on you, little Pratham. And keep firing away those math problems. And we really look forward to seeing you more and more on this platform. OK? okay. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for joining us. See ya. Adios. OK, one more. One more. Uh, come in. We have a. Uh, our next young person coming out here and joining us is our last winner of this edition. And let's uh, bring on stage Gregory Abrino Fernando, builder of PC Master App, a participant in Cisco 2019 Hackathon, where he created a 3D Unity platforming game in under 24 hours. And finally, the recipient of the President's Award given out by the US Department of Education and signed by then current president. My God, where is he? He's on the screen. Wow. Along with him, we have his teacher. Hello. We have Rajiv Dave. Uh, Rajvi Dave, I beg your pardon. First of all, Gregory, hi. Congratulations, buddy. Thank you, sir. Thank That's you. a very big room in a, in, in, in a small body of yours. <laughs> Thank Doing you very much. Very well. How did you achieve this feat? How did you manage to do what you did? I just put my mind to something. I keep on trying until I can finally get it right. I don't settle for less. I keep on trying until I hit the goal. Fantastic. Are well, you going to put your mind to a great question you're going to ask Kamen now? So, um, Kamen, sir, what inspired you to become an astrophysicist? Did you just decide you want to study the sun one day? That's a great question. Thank you very much, Gregory, by the way. And uh, Rajvi, uh, great job. Um, you're, you're an inspiration to me right now. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I started without that much interest. Uh, when I was a little kid, obviously. Uh, and then there was a, um, a little observatory for the, uh, for the general public uh, that was right next to my grandmother's house when I was little. And then they uh, offered the solar observation uh, and, and observations of the planets, of the moon, uh, and so on. So I started attending uh, and thinking, you know, what, what is happening out there, this, these amazing worlds that I'm seeing. So little by little, I got into astronomy. And then the final moment was when I was first able to, to observe uh, a total solar eclipse. Uh, so this was a long time ago, um, but I was just in complete awe of what the, the universe, what nature was capable of doing, looking at the solar corona. And then from then on, I, I just got really, really into uh, astrophysics and solar physics, and, and I was able to thankfully uh, continue my education uh, and then start really digging into the of the universe. So that's what did it really uh, one total solar eclipse, and I highly recommend uh, if you haven't seen it to uh, make an effort to go uh, to a path of a total solar eclipse and observe. It's really um, humbling uh, to be able to experience such a thing. Gregory, does that answer your question? And I have yes. to ask you a question. What do you yes. want to be? What do you want to be? One day I hope to open up my own video games company because I enjoy playing video games, but I more enjoy making my own. So it's just been a passion of mine that I hope to continue in the future. Well, if you're making them in under 24 hours, I don't think that's too far off. <laughs> Thank let's you. Let's find out. Let's, let's find out from Rajpi his progress and, uh, and, and how he's doing. Tell us a bit about this young, talented lad. Uh, frankly, I don't have proper words. He is truly exceptional. Like we teach a, a lot of students during the entire day, but you know, rarely you get such students to like uh, you know continue. And uh, to be to be very honest here, I have just got a few classes with him. He had some other teacher as well. So I, I, I don't want to take the entire credit. But yeah, actually, 90% of uh, credit uh, goes to Gregory. He just 
does a wonderful job and i have witnessed this thing like you know when he fi- when he fixates his his vision on a goal there's no coming back so i i am a witness to that and i'm i'm really really a proud teacher well don't be too modest teachers are the ones doing all the great job out here by encouraging all these young kids these young prodigies to move on and uh, create their goals so good on you as well rajvi thank you so much for thanks so much thank encouragement so. to him and gregory brother i salute you may you go on winning many more awards may all presidents that come later in life also keep signing these lovely things for you <laughs> thank you sir all right when you have a game you know myself when you have a video gaming company please send me some games as well <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> thanks bro thank you but then it'll be like a ps14 or something a playstation 20 would have come out by now. <laughs> all right thank you so much thank you so much for joining us rajvi thank you thanks so much thanks a lot thank, thank you, you so thank much you for the yeah. yeah. all right and those uh, common word are protégés and uh, we we've, we've seen three of them there are many more on this platform we had a great time talking to them but uh, i have to ask you common Uh, and first of all tell you that it was such a pleasure and a delight first of all to watch that lovely video you showed us and then to showcase all the wonderful information you did to all these young adults i have learned and i have enjoyed myself thoroughly any final words you'd like to say to all these young aspiring prodigies who have the world in front of them well first of all let me say i was impressed with uh, with those students they're fantastic and gregory just wants to make people happy by uh, having a company for video again that's fantastic um well final words i really want to wish all of you the very best for tomorrow's hackathon uh i truly believe this is a unique learning experience so really you should uh, uh profit from it so and and of course have fun on this mission uh mission mars uh and remember that the hackathon goes live in another 12 hours So I'm uh, I'm really eager to see who will be winning uh, and the uh, all the cool amazing projects. Thank you so much for those final words Carmen. Thank you so much for giving us this insight into this amazing world that exists above and beyond. I've had a pleasure chatting with you and are you showing me the comment on the way back? Out? Are you going to yeah. share it? Yeah. I, I I reached out. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Still there. Still there. We got a recipe to a comment. Oh, it's hot! It's hot! It's cold! I don't know. What, what is it? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. So it's so cold that it's it's super hot. All right. Thank you. Thank you for this lovely chat. Thank you for joining us once again. There are lots of emojis that are flying out out here. You can take them as virtual claps. They're all clapping for you. Thank you. You've been a star. Thanks, Amir. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Well, thank you, folks. And uh, just as the speakers have mentioned earlier. the hackathon quiz window is open for the next 12 hours after the quiz window closes you can start the final hackathon project you will have 20 hours to submit 11th of july and 12th of july don't forget to send in your entries we are eagerly waiting for those we are pasting the hackathon link in chat also we'll be sharing a link for your feedback as well this truly was a wonderful night and i have never been so close to outer space until now now you could get even closer to with the mission mars hackathon boys and girls have a good night good evening good day no matter where you are joining us from we will see you on the next edition of creative space in august 2021 please leave us a feedback on the link shared in the chat below thanks everyone bye bye and see you soon the mission continues